All right. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for attending today's webinar. And thank you to KISS for making it happen today. Uh, we're discussing how to build cyber resilience in a post-COVID world. I'm joined by Chip Chapman, co-founder and director at Quantum Resilience, who will walk us through just exactly what building cyber res resilience looks like within this, these new challenges that law firms are facing. Uh, before we get started, just a bit of housekeeping. We will open up for just uh, some questions at the end. So please do engage, post your questions in either the chat or the Q&A sections. Um, Chip has some extra resources, including some slides and a free copy of his book, Notes from a Small Military, which will be circulated after the event. Uh, a recording will also be published should you wish to refer back or share around. Um, one last thing is a prize draw is happening today. Quantum Resilience is offering a fully funded strategic overview, which, which is worth £7,000, the winner of which will be notified after the webinar. So please keep an eye out for that in your inboxes. Um, it's a really good offer. Um, and I hope you enjoy today's webinar. So Chip, I will, um, I'll hand it over to you now and you can take it forward. Okay, thank you, Kaylee. Uh, I will be using some slides later, but I won't uh, put them off at the moment. So what do we class as resilience? Well, resilience for us is the abilities. And cyber resilience therefore requires two plans. The first is your everyday ability to protect and defend left of hack or breach. That's your threat anticipation, your threat hunting and your security modeling. And that, of course, is both technical and human parts. The second is the response plan once a breach has occurred. That's the right of hack. And that really is your business continuity plan. Because really, this is about business continuity after perhaps incident analysis, auto containment, and attacker eviction. All those things that you can automate, and probably most of your practices do that now once you've fulfilled your legal and regulatory responsibilities. Uh, after a hack has occurred, uh, you may well have a security incident and event manage management system SIM already. Now, is this largely academic? Well, it's not. Why do I say that? Well, last Friday, I received an email from an organization called St. Luke's, uh, Luke's Hospice. Now, St. Luke's Hospice, of course, is a place where palliative care is given, and I contributed some money many years ago for both the death of my mother and an aunt, but St. Luke's Hospice uh, outsourced its, um, its data to Blackboard. And Blackboard, as you know, has just had a global breach. You may have heard about it because there are various universities in the UK which have been breached, along with various databases, which uh, we learned of yesterday of the National Trust, and St. St. Luke's Hospice was part of that. And that also is telling in its own way, because if you look at Blackboard, Blackboard is a, a cloud security company which is active in 100 countries and what they say on their website is that in May, of course, they discovered this ransomware attack. They didn't actually inform the ICO and their regul like regulatory bod bodies until uh, July, so I think they're going to be in the poo in the future. But what's telling is this. They say that they follow industry standard best practices, our security info team leverages the industry standard triad model, that's confidentiality, integrity, and availability, in conjunction with various industry control frameworks, such as NIST, CSF, which if you're an American, that is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and that follows the identify, protect, uh, detect, respond, recover model. They also follow ISO uh, 2000, 27001, which we would expect all legal practices to be following at the moment, along with SOC 1, um, SOC 1 Type 2. So there you have a company, a cloud software company, which has good governance standards and yet had a massive breach. And we'll come on to all those things and why it probably had uh, that breach a bit later on, because a lot, lots of them affect you. But first, let's start by asking two questions. Now, firstly, why do you have a lock on your car door? And secondly, why do you wear a seatbelt? Well, you have a lock on your car door to stop the opportunist theft uh, stealing your car. Now, you can't stop the professional thief because a professional thief will get into your car and he'll get into your house. 
regardless of how many locks you have. And that really is the same in cyber. It's uh, Turing, the sort of father of cryptography's line that there's no such thing as an impregnable door, whether front, back or side. There are strong doors and degrees of security. And the professional thief in that sense is a nation state. Now, I wouldn't expect you to be attacked by a nation state unless you were a very, very large company, which we're not dealing with at the moment. So the second question, why do you wear a seatbelt? Well, you wear a seatbelt to mitigate the impact of a crash. We wish to prevent in this case and mitigate a cyber car crash. And a car really these days is a computer that takes you from A to B. It pumps out so much data that it could automate a fine system if you exceeded the speed limit on a smart road. But we don't like automating justice. And this also really shows us the limits of AI. AI artificial intelligence is great at content ID, for example, you can Shazam a song to see what that is. It could tell you what the weed is in my garden growing amongst my, um, uh, amongst my peppers. And yesterday I came across one I'd never heard of before called a bacon weed. There you go. Uh, but it's not great at automating um, human judgment, the judgment of uh, average people, because we can disagree about what is reasonable, a reasonable or a correct decision. And it's the same with cyber, for example, what is spam, what is not spam, and it is fundamentally dubious about human behavior. Will you click or not click on a link? Will you be one of those people who plugs a data stick into your computer uh, out of curiosity? And to give you an example about that, in 2016, the University of Illinois left 300 data sticks around the campus. 98% of people picked them up, of which 45% plugged them in to check the files. 19% of those did that out of curiosity. So people are often the weakest link in what you do. Now, MI5, for example, have had a massive surge in AI and machine learning after the terrorist attacks in 2017. But in a telling comment by the review of terrorist legislation, he said the world depicted in the film Minority Report, if you've seen it, it's one with Tom Cruise in, remains strangely fictional. And you can see that really also from the last terrorist attack. So for example, the 21st of June terrorist attack in Reading, you always get this thing about he was known to authorities. You know, no shit Sherlock, you know, anyone who's ever been a criminal has been known to authorities. But the difference between being a, for example, a, a, a ideological extremist and then having the data to, to, for that guy becoming a violent extremist is two different things. So there are lots of things you can automate in the cyber world. And indeed we are doing this with artificial intelligence. But you cannot automate people and their judgment uh, criminal recidivism and things like that are very, very difficult to do. And this is all very relevant to the home or remote or hybrid working environment where based on dozens of red team analysis, it's clear that distributed working environments create significant complexities from a security and management perspective. For example, 60% of organizations have misconfigured firewalls and home working is where IT and technology really meets security. And home since COVID has started is where the heartache is, both from a technical proficiency perspective and from the perspective of cyber security. Now, many have struggled with the limitations of IT. And indeed, when we do it in a rehearsal for this a couple of days ago, we actually had a power cut where I live. So that rather skewed that. But the most um, prominent technology issues, as opposed to cyber issues, which affect people, have, according to a July 20 Riverbed survey, been the following. Poor quality of uh, video meetings, 40% of people have experienced that. Frequent disconnects from corporate networks, again, 40%. Slow file downloads, 38%. And these issues have been impacted on increasing uh, technical disruptions, again, 38%. Weaker employee performance and lack of productivity, 37%. But you can also contrast that with a CIPD study last week, uh, which said that 28% of people have had increased productivity and efficiency, drug judged not on hours worked, but on output. 
but also two other aspects relevant to this for the future in this home hybrid uh, working environment is increased anxiety and stress with 37 percent and a lack of work motivation of 34 percent now the bring your own device era has increased every business attack vector and this is particularly why you need to secure your endpoint devices when you're in the home working environment now, of course there's been an explosion of software tools for this with an explosion of nomenclature as well you know unified endpoint management unified endpoint security Manage detectment and respond MDR solutions, scanning for those compliance and security vulnerabilities. Now, I was a um, commander, and when I was a commander, um, uh, I looked at my organization. Can you see that okay? I looked at my organization in four ways. I looked at it through an organizational, a technical, a human and a procedural perspective. And cybersecurity is no different to this. It is a combination of technology, processes, and people. I don't know if you um, want to, sorry, Chip, I don't know if you want to try to share screen a different way. I don't think it's cool. No. Not seeing that. No, not seeing anything. Not seeing that? Mm -mm. If you want to post not it in the chat or we'll start. No, not seeing it. Okay, I'll go back then. It doesn't matter because ultimately you're going to be getting the, um, you're going to be getting the PowerPoint at the end. So don't yeah. worry about that. Um, so with, uh, it's the same in um, cyber security. So it's a, combination of technology uh, processes and people but this should also include organizational for you for the disruptive challenges that might occur after a breach um, what what goes into your playbook what are the responsibilities of people in your organization for crisis and consequence management and talking of people only last week general nakasoni who heads both nsa and cyber command in the US reminded us, and this was actually in relation to the US election, but is wider than that, that 90% of the threats that adversaries are using use the most simple techniques. That is, he told us to avoid clicking on links that lead to malware or ransomware, patching your operating systems and using passwords properly. Now, with modern asynchronous working, you do not need to be physically gathered together as we are at the moment things can be delivered remotely. And indeed, eight months ago in a lecture, I was talking about this, that you no longer have, have to have the sage on the stage. Instructions can now be delivered remotely in the connected world, the long awaited prediction of the demise of the analog experience in the digital world. But there's a perhaps there because most people of a certain age, particularly those under 40, now have an eight second filter. If the network generation don't see something that interests them, they move on and indeed I'm sure during the time that I've been talking some of you have um, actually been using your devices. Um, are you still seeing me okay Kaylee? Yeah I can see you just fine Chip. Now that doesn't uh, uh, impact on cyber security directly but it does impact on communication, leadership, training and mental health. So we've now moved on to the third era of working where the first age was defined by the rhythms of the church bells, really in four-hour blocks, which the monastery would call you to do things. The second age, where mechanical time defined the routine, the clockwork perception and industrial age conception of time. Typically, people working nine to five. To the third age, where now we have drip engagement and a distributed approach to working and collaboration and time unless we impose some limits on time and the place of engagement, because otherwise people will be working any hour, every hour, and we really need to impose some order on that. In a recent US talk again, they, uh, in the legal sector, they talk about, uh, talked about the legal sector becoming the uh, 17th area of critical national in, uh, infrastructure. I don't think that's true, certainly from my own perspective, the, 17th critical national infrastructure in the UK at the moment with COVID is childcare. And that is why you see me 
with uh, my background at the moment, because I have two studies here, neither of which I'm in, because my daughter and son-in-law are here because they have an 11 month old baby with no childcare. So that is what is uh, also caveating people going back to work, uh, which the government don't necessarily um, understand. Can you see that now, the uh, slide which I've got up? No? No, no slides. Do you want okay. us to try to do that for you, Chip? Yeah, that's the third generation working uh, slide. We'll get that up to you. Okay. So we already have a changed childhood experience. The geography of childhood has shrunk really to the back garden, garden assuming people have a back garden. And again, that's a big assumption. A trite example, but only three out of 10 could now identify a blackbird, but nine out of 10 can identify a Dalit. Those who are under 30 are the digital natives. They're technology dependent, but have also, also are used to having their, um, their lives organized for them. Now, for some reason, when I was in the States a few years ago, uh, I, I took a book, I took a note in one of my black books entitled Five Things I Wish I Knew When I Started My Law Firm. Um, two of the five, uh, the first two of the five, and you can ask me what the final three were if you want, were these. The first one, that's while, while it's important to keep overheads low, spending a little to solve big problems makes sense either in technology, infrastructure, or even lunch dates, uh, dates to get referral sources. The second one is skate to where the puck is going, not where, not where it's been. And the puck is going into the digital world where we have to get used to either this hybrid model of working from uh, home, going into the office from time to time, slide two please, or, um, or, uh, or, or going to the office. So you might need to spend some money to make sure you've got the right inf infrastructure. Now, if we can move on to slide three, please. When I worked on the National Risk Register, these were some of the factors that we looked at. But the key thing about the National Risk Register was uh, it is an assurance matrix. And that is the same with the contestable domain of cyberspace, which affects you. The problem is really always being with the cheese, not with the mouse. If you can move on to slide four, please. So in terms of the infrastructure of the internet, this is the contestable domain of cyberspace. And this grid, the nine by five grid, really rep represents all those things which you need to secure. The problem really has always been with the cheese, not with the mouse. The architecture in a sense was never designed to be um, contested while it is contested on a daily basis. So your assurance is required everywhere in this matrix, at rest, your data, or whatever, at rest, in, in transit, and in the cloud, if that is where you store your data. Now, of course, NCSC used to be called CESG, that's the Communications Electronic um, Security Group. That was all about information assurance. And indeed, that is the sort of cyber hygiene which you need to be looking at. So it's important that uh, your critical data is backed up securely. You can use the, the cloud as your backups and it may be suitable for that as long as you have the procedures in place to prevent your backup from being corrupted during an attack. That is preventing ransomware overwriting your recovery by choosing a service that keeps multiple versions of backed up data with multiple uh, multi-factor authorization to protect that backup and with you limiting the number of accounts to those with the ability to access the, the backup. If you're not doing that, you're vulnerable. Now, this would come back again to um, Black, uh, Black Corp and my, uh, and my fact that the St. Luke's Hospice was, um, was breached. Why were they breached? They were probably breached either from an insider attack, which we'll come on to in a minute, or because someone had the permissions they didn't. If we move on to the next slide then, please. And when I was trying to think of what might be your worst case, on the right of this screen, you'll see um, that's actually the sun. That's a coronal mass ejection, a CNE giving out um, various X-ray flares. But actually, the fact that you may have a coronal mass ejection is irrelevant. It's what would be the impact of that in terms of your business continuity. And the worst case I could think of is 
how would you operate if the internet stopped for a week or a month in terms of your business continuity? So you should always look at that because there is this kind of potential for an internet kill switch in uh, most countries. The architecture of the internet actually means it's very difficult to do that in very advanced countries, uh, but not necessarily um, something that you couldn't do. If you want an example of that, look at Iran last November, where they did sort of adopt an internet kill switch to stop social media uh, when they had lots of protests. Let's get on then to the next slide, which is the legal business environment, the things which really concern us. So what are the threats? Well, no surprise is that most legal firms have excellent standards of cyber security. Yet despite this, 15% of a global sample of law firms between January and March this year showed signs of compromised networks. And these compromises result from an overwhelming attack rate on law firms globally. Data, risk and privacy management should be at the heart of every IT operation and cyber program protection. So preventable breaches in the legal sector include failure to patch known vulnerabilities, misconfigured firewalls or network infrastructure, unsecured databases, social engineering malware. So 80% of breaches occur behind the firewall and most are employees innocently clicking on phishing mails or opening files they shouldn't. So spy agencies such as GCHQ and NSA might be thought to breach computers via their tailored access operations. That's the thing called TAO using zero day capabilities. Zero day capabilities are flaws in the software, some of which are retained by security agencies to use against other malevolent states when they need to. But they don't. Most of the time, the most prevalent way of gaining access to people or organizations or computers or networks is actually through credential stealing or password harvesting. So what are the attack types? The most common methods of attack type in the legal sector are by type, firstly, criminal pursuit of sensitive um, financial information and PII, personally identifiable, identifiable information. And of course, if I was giving this uh, sort of talk four years ago, I'd, been, uh, I'd be briefing you up the yin yang about GDPR. And that has not gone away. Information assurance, data assurance, data in transit, data in the cloud, that's where you uh, all need to be aware of that. So if we can move on to the next slide, please. So if I'm a, a bad guy, or I'm a, a, someone in a spy agency, I'm looking to do something under the mnemonic of crime, compromise, revenge, ideology, money, ego. These are the ways that you, your employees are compromised generally. And we'll see on the next slide why a, a method of doing this so, for example, I've got um, not a bad following on um, Twitter. And here's a picture of the lovely Pamela. And Pamela had followed me. Uh, but it was obvious to me because she follows 1,149 people and had six followers that she was a social bot. Now, malware really is three types. It's spyware, it's ransomware, and it's social bots. She is a honeypot. She wants to engage me in conversation direct message me and then compromise me and then she can buy that method maybe gain access to uh, information that I, that I have on a network. Next slide please. So of course she's not Pamela, she's actually Madison Shipman, which I didn't know, I've never heard of Madison Shipman, but that's who um, she, she was, Madison Shipman. Um, but of course I, I did a reverse image search, found, found out as she was and wasn't going to follow Madison Shipman. So that's the way that you go about things. Uh, in terms of the next thing which happens, which is ransomware, uh, which is what they, uh, people often do to you. Uh, third party risks is the next uh, big method of attacking legal firms at the moment. And third party risks are those uh, organizations that you allow onto your networks. This is quite prevalent. So if you look, for example, at one of the biggest hacks uh, in the last five or six years, and that's Target in the US, which caused $172 million of damage in December 2013. They were attacked through um, a third party vendor, which had access to by giving, uh, sending emails for their billing and contract system. The malware was inserted through an organization which didn't have good security 
protocols. So wherever you need, you let onto your network, you really need assurance that they also have good security protocols or otherwise you're gonna be uh, under problems. The next one is uh, password breaches. Now it is still the case that 94% of cyber threats originate in the email environment. And that is under four really, four things. Firstly, supply chain account takeover. That is essentially what happened with Target. Secondly, was social engineering uh, and solicitation. That is Madison Shipman or Pamela in my case. Thirdly, compromised employee credentials. And fourthly, spear phishing. So what needs to be done on all these things? Well, it should be pretty obvious that you should never reuse a password. Dropbox, for example, was broken because a password was used on another site, which was then harvested. So if you have the same password, which you use on multiple sites for both work and corporate methods, then you're probably not doing the right thing. So change your passwords frequently. And it's extraordinary that uh, data shows that 40% of people never, uh, never change their passwords in the last five years. Secondly, you need to, of course, enable um, two-factor auth auth uh, authentication. Thirdly, on some of your devices, try and use uh, virtual private networks, particularly on your phones. Fourthly, never completely trust cloud-based services. Next, make sure you monitor 24-7 for anomalous activity. Take responsibility for data protection seriously. Make sure you have left and right uh, hack services and use endpoint security. And make sure you wear a seatbelt. Now we talked about why you wear a seatbelt to mitigate cyber threats, but the belt of the seatbelt is really briefing, education, lessons learned and training. Having a policy is not enough. You need to actually train people properly. And I'm not really talking about, I was asking my son this, I said, do you do any training for these sorts of things? And he said, yes, we do. But everyone is so busy, they just generally get one person to do it as a tick box exercise. That is not the way to train your people. Now going on to the uh, home and corporate networks, it's just worth saying in terms of the company responses here, that the current data shows that 45% of home networks have malware um, on them compared to 13.3% of corporate networks. Why is this? And this is where you know, home is where the heartache is really comes in. Not everyone has been issued with a corporate device. They probably should be, or you know, your BYOD policies. Not everyone, everyone is on a super well protected and monitored device. Devices including smartphones and laptops and endpoint related attack vectors such as OS vulnerabilities, app vulnerabilities, browser and malware vulnerabilities, illustrate securing that endpoints is often the Achilles heel. So all the above represent a scaling challenge for the future if home working is to become the new normal. And that is what you need to look at really in the future if you're not gonna have a serious problem. I think I'll stop there, otherwise we won't have enough problems for um, questions and for Kaylee to interrogate me. Great, thank you so much, Chip. Um, just a reminder to everyone, if you have any questions, please post, the, post them in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, actually, we do have a question here, which I'll start off with. Um, we have a question from Sandip who asks, I wonder if you could share some of your views on the payment of ransom demands. Most law, firm, law enforcement agencies discourage payment. Does ransom insurance encourage crime? When you get the slide pack, you will see that I've included two slides from NCSC, National Cyber Security Organization. NCSC's advice is of course not to pay ransomware and I've already given you this illustration, I think that Blackball actually paid the ransomware. Um, I would say to you don't pay the ransomware but make sure that you have, uh, as I illustrated with um, what Blackball should have done, in that you need backdrop data so that the point that when you were breached means that you still have retention of um, the data that you uh, you needed now for example if you were a uh, a bank uh, a ceo of a bank uh, you would worry about corruption of your data every day so you must back up your data on a regular basis to ensure that um, you don't become vulnerable to the ransomware if you haven't done that then you possibly have no option 
other than to pay the ransomware, but then you have no uh, fidelity that um, they're not lying. So mm -hmm. you have to weigh that up. And this is why, again, you need to, once you've done your, um, your risk analysis, your risk threat vulnerability analysis on, on your technical capabilities, your people capabilities, and your procedural capabilities, um, that you have to take these decisions. Now, of course, this is also why you need to have a crisis and consequence management plan in place. Why I mentioned earlier on about having a playbook. It's very easy to have an org chart, but an org chart doesn't give you the responsibilities which fall to people once a major uh, incident has occurred in a company. Now, of course, the, this is also scalable, uh, but uh, the bigger the com company, the harder they might fall in terms of share price or any other things. And you can find lots of examples of all those things I said about crime and the compromise, where you need to look very carefully about how you do your playbook, because um, a crisis is not the time to be exchanging um, business cards. So what you do after a crisis uh, is really fundamental. And all those things which should be in your playbook include just the basics of who do you notify, how quickly. As we know, we've only got 72 hours, for example, to notify the ICO. We've already seen the example of Blackboard, and we know lots of others sort of uh, BA in terms of their um, major um, court case coming up in 2021, where people, for some reason, panic and don't do those things. So you need a handrail, which is why I call it a playbook. It doesn't really matter what you uh, call it. But you need to absolutely understand your actions on when something has occurred uh, as that handrail, because people panic when things have happened. They don't necessarily think logically. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to turn some attention to um, BELT, the briefing, education, learning and training, was it? Um, I agree with, I think at this point, many law firms understand that uh, people are their biggest threat, but I perhaps there's still a disconnect between understanding that and understanding what needs to be done to reduce that people risk. Do you have any top tips about how to go about that training and educating people? What needs to be covered? How often should you do it? Well, like all things, you need a battle rhythm for this. And again, what I really have said also is that it's no good just having a policy which says we will train people once a year and you potentially have some online learning, which is a, um, you know, which is a tick box exercise. Now, if you were to talk to a psychologist, a psychologist would tell you that um, giving people a load of principles like CIA that I gave you earlier on, confidentiality, integrity and all those things is a waste of time. People do not um, cognitively uh, understand things by principles. They understand things by examples and storytelling. So storytelling of things that have occurred cognitively is the best way to um, enable people to understand these things. Now, again, there are spam filters and there are all those sorts of things, but that is, they're not, uh, autom as I've said, automation of spam is not necessarily automatic. Again, there's, um, you know, it was the best of algorithms. It was the worst of algorithms. So um, people just need to be really reticent of anything that they don't uh, that they don't click on or or, or access. Uh, and you really need to train people by examples, not by principles, on this sort of thing. So having a again a playbook and a training pack of of examples of this and updating those in terms of those which occur which you can add to this or go to companies which will do this for you is, is really required. And, you know, all those examples that I've said of the 94% uh, showing that sort of social engineering and email domain is the, is the real weakness is something that, you know, companies need to take cognizance of. Mm, absolutely. Um, just to pick up on the automation point, what, where do you think the future of automation is in playing a role in, in cybersecurity? And will that actually solve any problems? No, automation is the future, but of course you, again, uh, have two parts. Automation can do, do so much, but again, it's that battle of algorithms between the attack vector and the defensive vector. But you, you still need oversight of, of, those, um, of the automation. 
And there's a lot of snake oil salesmen out there. So uh, if you thought there was a lot of um, acronyms in the army, the number of acronyms in the cybersecurity world is phenomenal. Um, so, you know, is, for example, AI uh, just sim with AI added on to the end of it? Um, but automation is the way to go in the future. But you need people who've you know, got the right data in because like all these things, what is AI? AI is various data sets put together looking for rules, patterns and various heuristics. Certain things it can do and looking at those patterns, but that doesn't necessarily, and it has to be trained in those. So the right data to train the AI has to be present for the thing to be 100% effective. There is no such thing as 100% effectiveness in the sense of Turing's um, Turing sort of line, which is still absolutely true. But what you're trying to do, particularly in the legal sector and uh, uh, other commercial um, vertical sectors, is to have an environment which is hostile enough for a malevolent actor, because most malevolent actors aren't state actors. They're either you know, activist, opportunist, um, cyber criminals. But if you make it difficult for them from the off in your environment, they will go elsewhere. And what you're really trying to do as much as anything is make those people go elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. In terms of um, cybersecurity and law firms in general and how law firms kind of approach it and view it, I think we were talking about before how many people, many leaders think that they're probably, maybe, maybe they have good education um, of staff, maybe they have some good systems in place that they think they'll never have an attack or never have been attacked. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on, on that scenario and how to kind of alleviate that mindset. Yeah, I would generally say to pick up on the, the last point that there's only really three types of firms. Those, those that have been hacked, those that don't know they've been hacked, and those who are yet to be hacked. Um, this is absolutely a, um, a leadership question. So it is not an IT question. So de de uh, delegating this to whoever runs IT is not the right thing. So either in the practice uh, leadership, I won't call it management because I do see a difference between leadership and management. Management for me is process, protocols, procedures, all that kind of stuff. Leadership is what sets the vision and the tone and everything else. So this is a leadership matter, which should be centered in, in one of the uh, agenda items in board meetings, so that you look at the risk variables. This really is about risk as much as threat. And of course, threat is intent, opportunity, and capability. The capability to attack you is out there. The intent is out there. You are trying to minimize the opportunity for that to happen. So understanding again and having it in your uh, your sort of either board meetings or practice senior meetings, the analysis of risk and what needs to be done in this environment, because this is, the bottom line is not necessarily about profit. Lots of companies think it is, but you will lose customers as if you do not have a secure cyber framework and environment to work in. Mm -hmm. And um, well, it's your reputation, of course. Yeah, absolutely. And um, just to turn the spotlight into this idea that we're moving toward or are beginning to prepare for the post-COVID world, I'm just wondering what your thoughts uh, on that is and where cybersecurity will move as we kind of prep for whatever that may look like. Well, I do, I do think we're in this environment where, and I think I did describe as either home, hybrid, whatever. I don't think people going back 100% to working in offices is going to be the model in the future. So if home is where the heartache is, we need to take seriously where either bring your own devices are or get rid of bring your own devices and have corporate devices which have the correct user endpoint management or user endpoint security on them. So that is the fragility at the moment where we have had an unregulated environment, including technical environments where people have uh, been in a video conferencing environment without necessarily um, the right um, security protocol. So for example, you take Zoom, a new end-to-end -end encryption in Zoom is coming in, in in July. I think you have to pay, pay a premium for it, but again, you would expect that to happen unless you think that the environment is such, and again, you can take a risk 
calculus on this that you know we are not uh, a company which uh, has either enough financial leverage or or whatever that it's it's worth it but of course the you have to decide in the size of your practice what are your crown jewels mm -hmm. is that your data and the um, PII your crown jewels and how do you ensure that that is secured 100% of the time day after day year after year month, month after month mm -hmm. do you think um the way law firms are going about this or, or people in the cybersecurity space, um, do they have the same assumptions that they had post the financial crash? Are there any learnings that people are moving forward from that? And do you have any uh, learnings from that time? Well, the, the thing which also is uh, clear from the last um, six months is that cyber, uh, cyber criminals have been working from home. Nothing's changed for them. <laughs> they, attack the they attack the vulnerabilities which they see and where they see the most opportunity at the time. So for example, um, the number of attacks on retail um, outlets went down significantly, not those you know, shops which are providing us critical national infrastructure of our food, but the sort of retailers on the high streets, those big sort of firms, the number of cyber security attacks on them have gone down because the opportunity is lessened. Um, so, they will go to where the low hanging fruit is. So the low hanging fruit is where the vulnerability is. So where they see a vulnerability, they will go there. So make sure that you don't have the vulnerability. It's worth saying that I have provided you a couple of slides in your slide pack, which define how I see threat, vulnerability and risk. Uh, so just giving you a sort of framework to do a, a TVRA, a threat, vulnerability, risk assessment. Uh, I'm sure you've already got them. Uh, if you haven't, you should, um, because um, you'll be very vulnerable if you've not thought about this or just contracted it out to someone else without some leadership from uh, uh, practice management or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, just to pick up on the, the five things I knew before setting up my law firm, what are the other three? What are the other three? Um, mm -hmm. The other three are... Some lawyers are just jerks. That includes the leadership. So again, if you've got toxic leadership, you may not, um, you might just say, well, bollocks, it's nothing to do with me. It's the IT guys thing. So, you know, leadership matters in this. There are various leadership models, but that's a sort of different day. So the third one, some lawyers are just jerks. Fourth one, I might just succeed. And the fifth one is malpractice insurance is really affordable. So, yeah, oh. those were the five. Do you think there, that's, I, I haven't actually heard people talk about um, the malware insurance problem. Do you think there is an assumption that that's going to be extortionate and that law firms probably shouldn't go for it? That's a, it's an interesting one, that, because um, you should be looking at cyber hygiene, of course, on, on a daily basis. Now, a, there was a recent study by um, Swiss Re saying that we should put cyber resilience as a factor which is looked at on a um, yearly basis in the same way that you do an annual financial audit or your accounts are audited. So your cyber should be audited. Now, um, again, there was a pushback from that based on we've got enough regulation in the industry, we don't want to kind of do that. But even though you have a financial audit, and you may not want to have a cyber official cyber audit. If you haven't considered uh, all those factors which give you cyber resilience and those risk and um, vulnerabilities that pertain to your environment, then you're not really looking at um, a holistic approach to your business. So you, you, can, you can sort of chin it off in a way but that doesn't mean you shouldn't um, shouldn't be thinking about it. So you might not have an official audit from a company. I would say you know, it doesn't matter what you call it, but it's it's worth doing that. And there's lots of ways to do that, of course. Um, again, given the size of the company, it, it's all dependent because something like penetration testing, for example, to, to show your vulnerabilities, which you should be aware of, can be an expensive business. Mm. Do you think... Um how often should law firms do an audit of their cybersecurity and I guess their, their practice and playbook? Well, you should, um, firstly, you should make sure that you've got training 
to establish a playbook. Now there's various cultures in law firms. So the best thing would be to get someone in to help you, but the writing of that should be done by the law firms because only the law firms know the culture that, they're, um, that they have within them. Now, of course, your, your cyber model is, is a 24 seven thing. So a company like Quantum Resilience will be, um, will be giving you, um, will, be, will be on your back saying, have you done this, have you done that on a, a periodic basis on various factors on, that you need to be looking at or have done to ensure that you are compliant with, for example, as I said, ISO 27001. And as a minimum, that should be uh, what you have to give you a good health check that you kind of know what you're doing and have followed a decent framework to ensure that you've minimized the chances of being attacked. Mm -hmm. um, just to bring up something that you mentioned very briefly at the beginning um, about people's behaviors and mindsets and how they're changing uh, in the world of work, but in general, you mentioned mental health. Um, mental health issues have been discussed more in the legal sector over the last few years. I'm just wondering from your perspective, how is that changing um, and how does that impact cybersecurity and training in this kind of new world that we'll be entering? Do you think that'll be some, a hurdle to go over and something to manage? Well, the real hurdle is, is actually within the cybersecurity expert world in this field. So if you're a CISO, the mental health of CISOs is terrible because um, there is a, uh, an overload on them. Everyone expects them to expects them and their, uh, and their subordinates to do everything uh, with a workforce which is often underinvested in and with a skills gap in the market. So from the cybersecurity in, uh, world, it, you know, if you have IT uh, cybersecurity specialists working in your company, make sure you look after them. It's not just those on the front line de delivering your outputs in terms of, you know, contracts signed off or uh, casework completed or criminal cases completed or whatever. So there is a real vulnerability in terms of uh, CISOs and uh, in terms of, well, the manifestation of what comes out of the stress that they're under, which is increased uh, alcohol abuse uh, and all those sort of factors that go with that. So there's a quite a body of literature on how this is impacted on, on CISOs. So don't forget those in the cybersecurity world. It's not just those who are delivering the front output from either a solicitor, barrister, legal, legal practice side of life. Mm -hmm. um, for the SME legal space, so most of our attendees here are from SME law firms who probably don't have that in-house cybersecurity expert, let alone an IT manager if they can afford one. Um, so how do you suppose we go about managing the relationship with external cyber or um, IT provider within an SME law firm? What does that relationship look like in the future? Well, it should be from a technical perspective, there are lots of companies that you can, uh, you can leverage to provide you with the automation on your systems to give you uh, some pretty good confidence on that. Again, you need to separate the snake oil salesman from the other, but you can do that through you know, cloud services or lots of companies will do automating services. So that's pretty good. But of course, you should first, within the practice, do your own risk assessment so that you can ask the intelligent questions of what service you require on the technical side. There are also companies that you can leverage to do the people side or companies which will do the both. You do need that training of uh, those who are vulnerable, which is you know, your people are vulnerable. They're the ones who make the mistakes. There's always the classic one quoted about how many people, people love cats, how many people click on pictures of cats on a Friday afternoon, which is psychologically a very vulnerable time for people uh, when they're, you know, in, uh, you know, thank God it's Friday mode. That is your psychological most vulnerable moment, Friday afternoons. People will do stupid things on Friday afternoons when they have this end of week sort of mentality. So, um, so you've got the technical, you've got the people side. And you've also got the procedural side. And of course, I'm saying that you need a playbook, but you need to exercise the playbook. Now, part of this can be done, of course, in the, you know, companies have turnover. And I don't know what the turnover is in legal firms across the, the global commercial market. It's something like 20% of people turnover in a year. 
all this should be done in induction if you've got new people coming in so that they know what standards you require of them certainly in the most vulnerable bits of how people manage their computer screens um, we've got two questions from the audience uh, the first one from alan he asks uh, can i can you just clarify what a playlist is and what it does uh, it's a, a playbook a playbook is your actions on so uh, uh, it's bringing um, order out of chaos so when something happens it gives you your actions on on any attack type vector and should give you the responsibilities that everyone in your practice should have either in the leadership sense or the subordinate sense and of course based on we don't have this expertise who you might have to go to and outside resources to bring in to help you manage and mitigate this so it's really your actions are on this equivalent of really when for example we were say in northern ireland and you had a bomb and you're in the operations room because of course you'll be around your boardroom and you open the book actions on bombs you know you call the ammunition technical guy to come in with his robot you know you lever the, the uh, helicopters to come and sanitize the area you put a coordinate all these things are kind of preordained based on the, the various number of things that may happen because in the modern world strategic planning which is very linear uh, is, is often not the greatest thing to do you need to do scenario planning because it's often a failure of imagination in the cyber domain and what it can lead to uh, which makes you vulnerable mm -hmm. great the other question is from andy who asks you've raised the fact that some are firm some firms are complacent and secondly this may be because of cyber and risk is largely seen as an intangible ex ex uh, expense can you think of a similar scenario drawing upon your military career where you were able to lead the change uh well <laughs> Well, I, yeah, of course. I mean, this is all to do with leadership. So um, the, the biggest one I had to do was um, I delivered normalization in Northern Ireland. So you know, I sort of commanded 15,000 people there. And this was really on the rather like things we've been talking about. There were sort of technical aspects that we had to hand over a lot of data, intelligence data, for example, to the police. Uh, and we also had to make sure that a lot of people we had to make redundant, all Irish regiments, uh, were made redundant with no um, scar tissue, human scar tissue, as it were. Uh, and that's where leadership comes in. Now, I can't, I, I could give you lots of lectures about leadership and, you know, the 10 critical factors for high, high team development and stuff like that. It's a sort of separate subject. But you only, um, you recognise toxic leadership when you see it, you often don't recognize um, good leadership. Uh, but um, there's uh, Jim Mattis, who I worked for, used to be the Secretary of State for Defense in America at one stage, always used to say, if you've got good people and bad processes, bad processes win nine times out of 10. If you've got complacent people and bad processes, you may as well shut up, sh shut up shop, to be honest. Um. I'm just interested how how do you if you do have toxic leadership or, or leadership that isn't doing what it should how do you help i guess recognize that and confront the issue internally because that could be quite a hard discussion to have if you're trying to move forward a business well if it doesn't the first thing is most people leave mm -hmm. and so your um your retention rate within your um, practice or whatever based on leadership may actually tell you something to begin with um, you should, of course, always have a culture where you welcome a challenge function. So in the way I did business, um, there is a time when um, you do your uh, mission analysis on threat, risk, vulnerability. Everyone has a chance to contribute to that. But ultimately, it is the, those at the top, practice managers, whatever, partners, who are the deciders. You then go around the cycle and then it's time to shut up until you do your next decision cycle based on what is happening either in uh, either in the uh, number of cases you've got or not achieving your targets or whatever. It's actually what we call the OODA loop. So you observe, orientate, decide, act. So the observe and orientation, you should welcome a collaborative approach to that and the input of everyone. You then decide 
end of discussion, you act, and then you go around the loop again the next time you need to do this. So again, you, you know, things evolve very, very quickly um, in the cyber world. So going around that loop um, a number of times because of technical developments is always worth doing. Uh, so don't be complacent. Complacency is the uh, fourth horseman of the apocalypse. That's what I always say in lectures. It's not death or pestilence. So complacency is the fourth horseman of the apocalypse. Great. Um, if there are no other questions, I think I'll wrap up with one final one. From your perspective, we've talked a lot, we've covered a lot in this discussion. If there's one, and it's going to be hard to reduce, but if there's one takeaway that uh, law firm leaders here listening in could take away to their practice and either implement or, or start looking at, what would that be in terms of cyber security in the next stage? The technical thing should be easy, but you really need to make sure that your people are inducted, trained, uh, and exercised properly in these things so that you maximize uh, their ability to use their initiative both in the legal sense and in helping you to solve the cyber, cyber problems which you're almost inevitably going to confront. 